we continue with the symmetric network, uh, finalizing this uh, chapter of general properties of the uh, standard rate equation. So let's write the equations again. write down the Lyapunov function. So the Lyapunov function has the following shape. The first term in the Lyapunov function is the sum of all pairs of neurons multiplied or weighted by the connectivity matrix. That's the first term. So let's imagine that we have a network of neurons. some of them are excitatory, some of them are stronger, some of them are weaker. <coughs> What's the interpretation of the first term of this equation? So remember, this is the, I'm, I'm arguing that this is the first term in the Lyapunov function. I'll add the minus here just to show that there will be another term. But I'd like to start with the, with the interpretation of this term. So what does the Lyapunov What are the properties of the Apollo function? What, what would happen in the dynamic if this would be the Apollo function? What would happen to it? It will decrease. So let's consider this term. When will this term be minimal? So this is sum over all pairs of neurons in the network. Well, this, the connections are not something that you play with. This is, uh, this is not something that changes throughout the dynamics. So what will happen to the firing? So one way of thinking about it is, let's consider two neurons, a pair of neurons that is connected with an excitatory sinus. Just one of the pairs. Let's say, I don't know, this pair of neurons. Let's consider just this pair of neurons. And there is a sign of J here. JIJ. So this is JJI. But JIJ is equal to JJI. So let's say that both are positive. When will this product... So this is so JJI. R I R J. So when we so what we have here is a product of the activities of the two neurons weighted by the 
synaptic way. So let's imagine that this synapse is excitatory, so J is positive. Then this term will be minimal if the product of Ri and Rj will be maximal, because we have the minus here. This product will be maximal if the firing of both neurons will be maximal. So this, this term will be maximal if neurons that are connected uh, by an excitatory synapse will fire at the maximum firing. You can think about this kind of a positive feedback that this one activates this one, this one activates this one. So when this is maximal, this product, then this term would be minimal. So that's the first term. Now, if the synapse is inhibitory, if the synapse is inhibitory, then the situation is more complicated. <coughs> but this would imply that the firing of, the, of, of these uh, uh, neurons, this product, should be minimal. Okay. Second term. So this is a sum over all pairs in the network. The second term has a, of the Lyapunov function has the following a shape. It's sum over all neurons. H i zero times R i. So what's the interpretation of this term? Consider a neuron that receives a positive HI. When will this term be minimal? When the rate is maximal. When HI is negative, then this would be when the rate is minimal. So one way of thinking about it, this is a term that is minimal when the uh, firing of the neuron is best aligned with its input. So in, this, in the direction of its input in, the, in, a, in a way that is saturated. This term is minimal when uh, uh, the pairs of neurons, activities of pairs of neurons uh, are uh, uh, um, Pairs of neurons are co-active in a way that is most consistent with the way that they are uh, connected. And then there's the third term. The third term is a sum of all neurons. Some fun of a function that I will denote by a capital G. And this capital G is an ugly integral. G of R is an integral from 0 to R of G to the minus 1 R prime dr prime. So G is a sigmoidal function. G to the minus one is the inverse, is the inverse of the sigmoidal function. And this capital G is an integral of uh, is an integral of this uh, sigmoidal of this G to the minus G to the minus one. So E is a function. So the question is... This E sum over I of G of Ri. Ri is a variable. Ri is a variable. The fine rate of the i neuron. So this 
to g of r. So this would be an integral from 0 to the activity. This would be g, this would be g of r i. This would be an integral from 0 to r i. I will talk about the interpretation of these terms later. Okay, we will leave it like this yeah, yeah, for the time being. So, in order to prove that this is a diaphanal function, we need to prove that, it, that this E satisfies three conditions. Right? What are the three conditions? One is that the temporal derivative of E is uh, non-positive, that E dot is equal to zero at the fixed point, and the third one that E is bounded from below. Right? <coughs> so let's, let's start. So the first thing to do <coughs> would be to look at the temporal derivative of E. So to, put to uh, compute the temporal derivative of E, we'll use a chain rule. So this will be again. can write the temporal derivative of E as a sum over all R of D, D, R, D, R, D, H, D, H, D, T. So let's look at the first term. This would be D, E, D, R. So this is sum over K. minus half sum over i and j j i j delta j k times r i <coughs> plus delta i k r j right this would be to take the derivative of e respect to this this one and then with respect this would be to this one. Second term would be minus HK zero. And what would be the third term? G to the minus one of 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 R K. Questions? can we say about the first term? So we have a sum of i and j. Here we have the delta function of j, so the only contribution that we will get is when j is equal to k. And the only contribution that we will have here is when i is equal to k. So let's, let's look at the, at the uh, first term. This 
can be equal to minus k, I will, the minus and the half I will deal with later. So this will be sum over j, j i j, sorry, j k j k j l j now the first term is equal to the second term because j i j is equal to j j i so this will be equal to for the notation, j, k, j, l, j. Minus h, k, z, o. What about this term? So what can we say about g to the minus 1 of l? about this term, looking at this equation. This is just equal to minus tau hk dot. that jj is equal to jji. So the EDT, going back to this equation, is equal to sum over k. Here we have minus tau hk dot, and here we have hk dot. This is equal to minus tau sum over k hk dot squared. Times this term. What can we say about the r the hk? R is equal to g of hk. So the r the hk is just the derivative of g this would be g prime of hk. Now if g is a sigmoidal function of h, then the derivative of g is positive. And then this term is negative. And is equal to 0 only when hk dot Why g is positive? The derivative of g is positive because it's a sigmoidal function. The fine rate is not only increasing its function of the input. So 
So the only thing left to prove is that this function is bounded. Right? Bounded from below. If we prove that this function is bounded from below, then we are done. function and g to the minus one, the interpretation of this. So let's say that g looks something like this. How will g to the minus one look like? So when x goes to infinity here, y goes to this saturation level. So this is g. I call it g of h. So how would g to the minus 1 look? finite value of y, the value of g to the minus 1 would be infinite. Right? You with me? So, <coughs> so this finite value of g, g to the minus 1, will go to infinite. What about the other direction? So for a finite value when x here is minus infinite, then g to of x has a finite value, the saturation value. So g to the minus 1 to the saturation value will go to minus infinity. So g to the minus 1 will look something like this. of this function from 0 to some value, so this function will be, uh, uh, this, this term will be, will be positive. And the other terms, where well they are bounded, because R is bounded, if R is bounded, then these terms are also bounded. This sum is bounded, this sum is bounded this would be uh, uh, bounded, so uh, this E function is bounded. Now let's talk about now the interpretation of this, uh, of this uh, uh, G function. So the these terms will be maximal when R, when the R's are maximal in absolute value, depending on on, uh, uh, on the sign of J and sign of H. What this term does, it, uh, uh, this term would be, uh, the, the, the role of this term is to contract all the values 
in the direction of, a, of, of some middle value. It's, it's easier to, to see it if we consider a particular uh, a sigmoidal function if we use a hyperbolic tangent. This is something that we will uh, use later. But uh, wh what this term does, it prevents ours, if you like, from, from uh, saturation. These two terms, this, the, first two, the first term drives the activities of the, of the neuron to be in the direction of the external input. This term drives the activity of the activities of the neurons to be congruent with the corresponding synaptic efficacies. And this term drives everything to one, uh, uh, to one common value. So when this term dominates, then there will be nothing interesting in the network. The activity of the network would be, the fixed point of the network would be independent of these terms. When this term becomes unimportant, then uh, uh, the pattern of activity in the network would be dominated by these terms. But this one would prevent, prevent things from, uh, from reaching the bridge. Okay, questions? So with this, we now have all the necessary tools to uh, start uh, uh, thinking about uh, biology and computation, and this is what we will start doing right now. So the first, uh, um, the, the, the topic of, of today will be working memory. So what is working memory? There are many definitions of a, a shorter memory or working memory in psychology. And I'm not going to go into definitions. I, I will just show you a few examples and discuss the uh, neural activity associated with these examples and why why, 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 this, uh, why, why these findings are a challenge? Why, why, why they're, why they're uh, interesting? So, one example comes from the work of uh, Ranulfo Romo from uh, Mexico City. And Ranulfo Romo uh, has been doing or has been studying uh, um, neural activity in different brain regions while the monkey is doing a very simple task, a very simple working memory task. And the task is, is the following. You have a monkey, and there is a vibrator here, and the monkey feels vibrations, and there's first a vibration with some frequency F1, and then a second vibration with a different frequency, and the monkey has to press a key indicating which frequency was higher. Now, if you know the work of uh, Mirava Hissar from the psychology department, she's doing similar things in the auditory domain. But one can do these things in, in, in the visual domain. In, in, in this, is a very, this is a very common task in uh, psychology. And the monkey learns to, to perform the task. So if you record the activity in primary sensory regions like S1, and S2 in, in, in uh, the brain of the monkey, what you find is the activity in these, re in these brain regions represents the, uh, uh, the frequency with, with a short delay after the actual. 
actual simulation. So in S1, you, there is a representation of, 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 the, of, the, of this function. And the, the activity follows these, the, 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 the greater itself. In S2, you find representation that is more noisy of the frequency of S1. So this is what you find in primary uh, uh, sensory regions. But if you look at it's a prefrontal cortex of the, uh, uh, of the monkey brain, you find the following pattern of activity. This is not true for all neurons. This is true for a small fraction of the neurons. But uh, uh, nevertheless, I think it's, it's very interesting. So what is presented here, this is a raster plot um, representing the time of spikes of uh, one neuron for different repetitions divided according to the frequency of the first thing. And what you see here is that during the delay period, this is during the delay period, which can be uh, typically uh, three seconds, but I think in this example it goes up to six seconds. What you find, what, 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 what you people find is that the fine rate of the neuron is proportional to the frequency of the first signals. And this is, this is quantified here. So what different colors correspond to different uh, uh, frequencies going from low frequency to high frequency and uh, the higher the frequency of the first stimulus the higher is the activity okay, or the higher is the fine rate during uh, the delay period and this is stimulus frequency or fine rate as a function of stimulus frequency and this is a, a monotonic uh, increasing function. Now the, my question to you is why is this interesting at all? Why should we care about it? So it is interesting because the, there is activity um, when the stimulus is over. Why is it interesting? Okay, so it's interesting if you're interested in well, me memory, then uh, it's interesting because this is a this can be thought of as, as a correlate, neural correlate of memory. But the <coughs> what, you, what you said, that activity, that activity uh, uh, is maintained even in the absence of stimulus, this is also interesting from a dynamical point of view. And my question to you is why, why is it interesting from a dynamical point of view? So let's say that you, you, you believe the standard model, the rate model that we have been discussing for the past uh, several weeks. Why should you be surprised when, when seeing these results? The rate of fixed point in the right uh, of the firing of the neuron. I'm sorry? The rate of fixed point in the right of the firing. So you say that this is a fixed point. We're talking about frequency of firing here, right? Because there's an input. So the, the firing rate is a fixed point. It's a dynamic. I mean, so, so what do you learn from, from this result about the fixed points? It's a dynamic. It's really according to the stimulus. So the fixed point changes in a code in accordance with the, with the stimulus. So your interpretation of the result, just, just, following, just reiterating what you said, you said, if I understood you correctly, that these different states of activity correspond to different fixed points. And the fixed points depend on the external. And you said here that that component, the, the right one, uh, is a fixed point. So, sorry? You, you talked about the equation presented here, but the right, the most right uh, term. Uh, yeah. So maybe the, you said that that one, uh, Well, so, so the, 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 the fixed point is determined by these three terms together. Yes. Now note 
that, uh, well, in the absence of, during the delay period, the monkey does not receive any input. Or put, let, being more precise, the input during the delay period is independent of the frequency of the first input. Right? During the delay period, there's no input, as you said, or no frequency-dependent input. So the, the, the equations governing the dynamics of the brain in this region are independent of this frequency. So as a dynamical system, the brain in this point in time is not is independent of this frequency. The equation governing the dynamics of the brain. So let's think about these as fixed points. So if these are fixed points of the dynamics, then this observation implies that the dynamics is endowed with many fixed points. One fixed point corresponding to this a, a level of activity, another one to this level of activity, another one to this level of activity, and so on. So from this example, it seems that the brain is endowed, or the prefrontal cortex is endowed by at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven fixed points. Now you can imagine that one could have done the experiment not only using 10 hertz and 14 hertz, but also using 12 hertz, or 16 hertz, or 20 hertz, or 24 hertz, and that the behavior would be qualitatively different. So with 24 hertz stimulation, the, the level of activity would be something between this level of activity and this level of activity. So looking at these results, it seems that the prefrontal cortex is endowed with a continuum of fixed points. With an infinite number of fixed points. So one is a it's an infinite number, but they're also very similar to one another. So the fixed point corresponding to 22 hertz stimulation is very similar to the fixed point corresponding to 23 hertz. So our challenge is to try and understand how dynamic, these dynamic equations can give rise to a continuum of fixed points. And we haven't seen any continuum fixed points or fixed points in, in, all, in, in all our studies so far, uh, uh, in all the examples, um, the, the, the fixed points were discrete. Now, to those of you who took Lotting's course about bifurcation theory, well, what happened in the bifurcation? So that I guess you, you the bifurcation that generate fixed points, where you can have a pitchfork pitch bifurcation in which one fixed point becomes three fixed points, two stable, one unstable. Or we can have a saddle node bifurcation where in which, let's say, no fixed points become one stable and one unstable. You can also have something like a Hopf bifurcation in which a, a limit cycle can become one fixed point. So in order to generate a continuum of fixed points, thinking about changing the parameters, somehow we need to think about an infinite number of bifurcations, which is something that is not easy to see how this can be realized in these applications. So the first lesson that we need to take from this example is that some observations about the brain are more interesting than others. So this is interesting, going back to your comment, this is interesting because it preserves information. So from that, that point of view, this is interesting. It seems to be the, 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 the correlate, the neural correlate working memory, so this is interested, interesting if you're interested in working memory. But this is also interesting in a, in a different way, in a dynamic way. It's not clear how such patterns 
pattern of activity can emerge from, from uh, uh, the interaction of neurons with time. So this is one example. But not the only one. There are many other examples. So um, these are two examples of uh, head direction cells. I no longer remember wh which animal they were uh, recorded, but these are neurons whose fine rate uh, is a, a, a function of the direction of the head, okay? The direction of my head. And they prefer a particular direction. So there's one direction in which they fire at a higher rate. Now, if you think about it carefully, these cells are conceptually similar to these cells. They are similar to these cells in, 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 in the sense that these head direction cells are also show this pattern of activity in the dark, in the absence of any sensory input. And in the network, you have a cell that has this preferred direction and another cell that will have a, a, a this preferred direction, another one that has this preferred direction, and so on. So when the animal is in different states, the network as a whole is in a different, going back to your terminology, in a different fixed point. But it seems that there is a continuum of fixed points, each one corresponding to a different direction of the head, and that, these, that the, the network maintains this pattern of activity even in the absence of input. So from what you know so far about neurons, how long do you think a network should be able to maintain a memory pattern in the with not through a fixed point? So what's the characteristic time of neurons? Maybe 10 milliseconds, maybe 20 milliseconds, what's the characteristic time of, of, of neurons? So we expect the network to converge to a fixed point within 10, 20, 30, maybe 40 milliseconds. And we computed the convergence time uh, uh, in, for this di in, in different examples in, in the last week. So it seems that this is a fixed point, as, 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 as you said, because this can be maintained for seconds. But it seems that the, that the network is endowed with a continuum of fixed points. And again, it's not easy to, 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 to see how a continuum of fixed points can emerge these uh, dynamical equations. And there are many more examples. Places. I'm sure that most of you know about places, cells in the hippocampus that fire when the animal is in one particular location in space. So you can remove, turn off a light, for example, remove the cues, and still you'll find place cells are, uh, uh, still represent location to the extent that the animal knows where it, where, where it is from memory. And again, there's a continuum in the sense that the, the, the this it seems that for every point in space there, 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 is, there are corresponding places, so the state of the network has multiple fixed points, each one corresponding to a different state. But these multiple fixed points form a continuum. Another place where, where this, this, uh, 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 this continuum, this conti the, the continuity of fixed points uh, uh, has been studied in the framework of uh, integration. So, uh, well, integration is, well, we all know what, what uh, integration is. So I'll show you one example so this is uh, uh, this is an ant that lives in the desert, and uh, what this ant does in the morning it leaves the, 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 the colony and it is searching for food and once it finds food it brings it directly back to the colony. Uh, it can bo go as far as hundreds of meters and. It lives in a region where there are very few Q 
cues, spatial cues. These are like desert only uh, uh, sand. But the animal somehow learns how to integrate its velocity to form a representation of the spatial location, which is continuous, and use this representation to find its way back to the cage. This is one fun experiment in which, in order to test whether animals form, so the way that you do the experiment is, well, you take, you, 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 uh, you catch this animal here, this end here, you move it to here, and then you, you, you observe uh, uh, its behavior. Now, if the animal would have been using special cues, then it would move back to the colony, but what the end does, it goes in the direction and distance as if it was still here, and then when it reaches this place, it starts looking for for the colony. That's how we know that these animals can that these animals use integration in order to find their place. And this is a fun experiment in which they were asking the question whether they also integrate in the z direction. So after putting the uh, they took the animal from this point and put it on this I don't know cost like I don't know how to call it. tilted uh, uh, path to see whether uh, they take into account the z-direction when, when computing the distance or they don't take the z-direction and it turned out that they, they do. This is an example of uh, just uh, 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 demonstrating that they take into account moving in the, the z-direction. So again, in order to do this uh, uh, task, you need two things. First, you need to do the mathematical uh, uh, computation of integration. And then you have to maintain the information in some form of, of the continuum of uh, fixed points. And uh, in the next hour, we will discuss how this can be uh, implemented using this.
שנים, כאילו, אנחנו מדברים פה על שינוי בערך של הפיק פוינט, לא? כאילו, לא הבנתי למה זה מצריך אינסוף פרוגנציה. בוא נסתכל על הדוגמה הזאת. את צודקת ש... אם את אומרת, אם את עונה לי ככה, את פשוט מעבירה את הבעיה למקום אחר. תסביר לי איך הנרונים האחרים משנים. אז למה פתאום מישהו צריך לפרוק את זה? אני אומר, הפתרון הוא שיש לך פיק פוינט, הרבה פיק פוינט, שכל אחד מתורגם, מכניסה את המערכת לפיק פוינט על ידי האינפוס, בהתחלה הוא נשאר שם, הוא מתכנס לאיזה פיק פוינט. בהתחלה הרבה פיק פוינט. עכשיו השאלה איך את מייצרת הרבה פיק פוינט. לא סתם, את צריכה לייצר כאן שני דברים, צריכה לייצר הרבה פיק פוינט, אין פיק פוינט. בכל זאת, גם הפיק פוינט צריכה להיות להם תכונה שהם קרובים אחד לשני. שפיק פוינט שלי זה 22 מרץ, הוא קרוב לזה 23, אז הוא שווה קרוב לזה. עכשיו, תחשבי שאיך את מייצרת את זה, את משנה את הפרמטרים. את מתחילה נגיד במודל שבו כל הג'יינים הם אפס. יש לך רק פיק פוינט עכשיו את מתחילה להוסיף את הג'יינים. מוסיפה, מוסיפה, את צריכה לקבל תפוקה.
So I would like to reiterate um, something that I discussed with one of the students during the break. There are multiple, so to have a, a neuron whose activity is a function of its input, this is uh, interesting but not terribly interesting and this can be understood in this framework. So you increase the external input, you change the fine rate, fine rate of the neuron. What is interesting here is that in the absence of external input, the neuron remembers the uh, um, thing that happened seconds ago. And this requires a multiple fixed point. So one possible solution is to say, well, okay, there are other neurons in the brain that remember the input. But this would be just moving the problem to a different brain region. So it could be that the prefrontal cortex neuron receives input from a brain region that memorizes uh, uh, the, 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 the frequency of stimulation. But again, so now we'll have to understand how the other neurons in the other brain region, how they can remember this, uh, this input. Uh, so we, we spoke about the ant. Um, there is one, one system that has been studied extensively, and this uh, uh, has to do with the uh, ocular motor integrator of the uh, goldfish. So this is the eye of, uh, of the goldfish. And uh, there is, in, in the brain stem of the goldfish, there is a region that is called area one, composed of uh, something like 40 40 neurons, and what you see here, this is a location of the eye, this is a location of the eye of the fish, and you can see that the fish is making saccades, so next, next time you say hello to your goldfish, then you can look at how, how it moves its eyes, in saccades, like we do, and um, in this experiment, while uh, recording the location of the eye, they also recorded the activity of a neuron in this uh, brainstem area, this area one, and this is an example of one neuron, and uh, this is the, the fine rate of the neuron, and uh, as you can see, the fine rate of this neuron follows the location of the eye. It, fo it follows the location of the eye not only when the uh, in, in, uh, when there is light, but also in the dark. And in fact, it, it's believed that this is, this, that information from area one is what is the thing that is driving the location of the eye. And if you look at the sc temporal scale here, it's about one second, so again, it seems that the, the, the system in area one has a continuum of fixed points corresponding to different fine grades and corresponding to different locations of the eye of the goldfish. So this issue of, of continuum of fixed points, this is something that seems to be a, a prevalent uh, uh, throughout the brain, not only in, in mammals, but also in, in other animals. What you see here, this is uh, the fine grade of the neuron as a function of the position of the eye. It's pretty linear. And this is in the dark. These are for, for different cells, and this is in the light. So it doesn't seem to depend on visual feedback, because be, the behavior is the same in the light and in the dark. And this is uh, uh, characterizing this uh, fine rate as a function of input uh, for, different, uh, for different neurons in the dark. And uh, to, to first approximation, this is something like a threshold linear function. Now clearly, uh, yeah, that's all I have to say. Questions? Yes. I thought that the notion of fixed point is when you preserve it again, then you return to the same fixed point. And when you talk about the continuum of fixed point, it seems like it will never return to the same fixed point. So it could be correct. In some sense, that's why this is why it is surprising. So typically, we think about isolated fixed points, and we know how, uh, how these isolated fixed points are generated through bifurcations. 
And here, as you said, it seems that if we will perturb it a little bit, it will be stuck in the other fixed point. So, what can you say? I mean, if you have two fixed points that are you know, adjacent, what, what can you say about the stability? That's why it's weird. From a dynamical point of view, this is weird, and that's why it's interesting. And soon we will, we will try and address it. And um, just to show you this uh, fun uh, movie, let's see if it works. What you will see here, this is the this is the eye of the fish. You already recognize it, uh, and what you hear is a spiking of a single neuron in area one, and this is the firing rate of the neuron as a function of the position of the eye. function resulting in, in, a, um, in, in, in constant firing rate between saccades which uh, uh, underlie the location of the eye of, the, uh, of this fish. Questions? Okay, so there are two issues that we need to understand. One is the issue of integration. So if, if we believe, we spoke about the end, but in, in the case of the goldfish, if the input is these uh, uh, bursts of activity that encode the magnitude of, of the saccade, then uh, the computation that is performed by, by this 
uh, by this area is, is, is integration. And the second problem, which is more general, is a representation of memory of analog information, this issue of multiple fixed points, or a continuum of, uh, of fixed points. So there are various ways of addressing this question. One can ask the question whether this is a, a single cell mechanism or a network mechanism. I mean, one question is whether this is done because of the specific properties of the uh, neurons in these different uh, uh, brain regions, and uh, or is it the result of network interaction? And it could be that in some places, in some brain areas, in some animals, it's a single cell property, and in others, it's, it's a network property. But even if you think about a single cell property, you still have the same issues, the same problem. I mean, how do you generate, when we talk about attractors and fixed points, we don't care too much whether this is a result of dynamics that is happening in, in the framework of a single neuron or in the framework of a network. The, the same uh, uh, principles underlying nonlinear dynamics work both in single cells and in networks. And we would like to understand dynamically how this uh, uh, comes about. And, and the issue of single cell mechanism versus network mechanism, this is something that, that has been around for, for something like a decade now, or maybe even more. Uh, it is generally believed that in most cases, specifically in, in, uh, uh, in the goldfish uh, integrator, it is generally believed that this is a property of the network, not of single cell properties. But there are other examples uh, in which uh, people have shown that something like this can be the outcome of processes happening at the level of single cells. Um, this is a, a very nice paper. Um, uh, this is a recording uh, in, in the entorhinal cortex. So what you see here, this is a, a, a recording from a neuron in a slice. Uh, in the presence of, of a carbacol. The details are not, not very important, but what you see here, this is a, a membrane potential of the neuron, and this is current injected to the neuron. Initially, the neuron, neuron is quiescent, doesn't fire any spikes. There's a burst of input, and then it starts firing at a, at a low rate, another burst fires at a higher rate, another burst at an even higher rate, another one even higher rate, and so on, and uh, um, this is just the fine rate as a function of time, and you can think about this cell as a cell that integrates these bursts of input. So this is a, this is a kind of an integrator, and this is in a slice uh, in the, when, when, when synaptic, uh, uh, um, when synapses are blocked, so this is a property of a single neuron, now, there's been a lot of discussions whether this is interesting because the stimuli used are very non-natural. These are four seconds. So these are very long stimulations, very strong stimulations. doesn't work for, for weaker stimulation. You need a, to use a, a, a very special combination of drugs in order for this to work. Um, so there have been discussions whether this this is an artifact, or whether this represents something that really is important for, for computation done in the brain. But I think that at least from a dynamic point of view, this shows that these things can, in principle, happen at the level of a, of a single neuron. doesn't seem to be the case. It's not clear that this is the case uh, uh, for the goldfish integrator. So this is an example of the goldfish integrator. This is a recording, a recording done in vivo. Um, and uh, this is current injected to a single neuron in area one. And uh, this was done to demonstrate the time scale of response of the memory potential of the neuron to, to its input. So this is 100 milliseconds, and I don't know, this may be 10 milliseconds or something like this. So these neurons, at least uh, the memory uh, um, the, the, the time scale associated with the dynamics of these uh, neurons is seem to be short in area one of the goldfish integrator. 
Uh, I mean, in principle, we can, one, one way of solving these issues of long time scales in biology is to, uh, uh, to think about processes that have intrinsic long time scales. I mean, if, if I die tomorrow, then my bones will keep on memory of, I don't know, my, le my, my height for decades, at least. So there are processes in biology that have long time scales. So in principle, one could, one could think about such processes as underlying a memory, and then computation has nothing to do with fixed points and with attractors. That's one possibility, but at least thinking about fixed points and time scale in these in neurons, the time scale seem to be short. So our challenge challenge would be to to, to try and understand how um, um, such memory can be maintained and how integration can be performed uh, uh, when the element when the time scale of the element is short. Questions. So, um, we will consider linear networks. So, so far we spoke about nonlinear networks. This is a network in which the uh, uh, activation function is uh, nonlinear. Non in, in this chapter, we will consider linear uh, uh, activation function. The reason is. is primarily is that it is much easier to do the math. But from a biological point of view, we do find neurons in many regions uh, whose uh, uh, Fi curve is approximately linear or threshold linear. This is an example from the cortex, pyramidal neurons in the cortex. This is a fine rate of the function of the input. So you have the saturation here, and here it's approximately linear. At some point, it will, it will saturate. But if we are interested in this regime, then it is approximately, uh, approximately linear. Um, talking about the goldfish integrator, this is not the input. This is the location, but again, neurons seem to be, well, we don't see saturation here in, in, in the positive part. So perhaps a, a threshold linear model is a, a, a good model to study, to study the dynamics. Questions? So let's let's uh, let's consider now the let's think about how these things can come about. Thinking about linear systems. So we have our, our equations, and I'm going to, to start with an example. I think it will be easier to understand um, how this continuum of uh, fixed points uh, come about in, in, a, in a simple network that is composed of just two neurons. So this will be neuron one, and this will be neuron two, and there will be two synapses here, and I will assume that uh, uh, both are characterized by the same synapse. So what can we say about this network? And therefore, so the, to, to, it will converge to a fixed point. Let's write down the equations. Now, uh, we're, we're going to assume that Ri is equal to Hi. We're not going to worry about negative numbers now. This is something difficult to solve. And this is uh, assuming that the G function, the nonlinearity, is just uh, uh, the identity 
function, and then we can write the dynamic equations of, a, of the two neurons. Tau r dot is equal to minus r1 plus, so this would be like minus h1, plus j r2 plus h1 zero. And we have another equation for the second neuron that will have exactly the same, uh, the same shape. Tau r2 dot is equal to minus r2 plus j r1 plus h2 zero. So how, how, how are we going to, 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 to solve this set of equations, or to be the dynamics? We can find the fixed points, okay. But, I, but in principle we can, I mean this, this is a set of linear equations, so we can come up with it. We can solve them can study the dynamics, not only the fixed points. Okay, so what would be the structure of the matrix? It would be 0, J, J0, right? So it's a 2 by 2 matrix. And what would be the eigenvectors and eigenvalues from symmetry? The one direction would be the homogeneous direction, 1, 1. So the other direction will be uh, 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 orthogonal to the 1 minus. So the direction we should consider are the sum and difference of the fine rate of the two neurons. So let's look at the sum. R1 plus R2 dot is equal to minus R1 1 minus J R1 plus R dot plus H1 0 plus H2 0. This will be one equation. This is the homogeneous direction the sum, and you can immediately see that, that uh, uh, it is dissociated from the difference. We have R1 plus R1 plus R2 here and R1 plus R2 the other side. And the difference would be tau R1 minus R2 dot will be equal to minus 1 plus J R1 minus R2 plus H10 minus H20. Or another way of, write, of rewriting this set of equations would be tau over 1 plus uh, j, let's call it delta r dot is equal to minus delta r, this would be for the difference, plus delta h. This equation corresponds to this equation. And the second equation will be tau divided by 1 minus j sigma r dot, it will be the sum, is equal to minus sigma r plus sigma h.
questions? So let's let's consider this equation first. So what what will happen to delta r? Delta r will converge to delta h in a time. How long will it take it to converge? What's the characteristic time? No. It will not be tau. Tau over 1 plus j. So if j is large, for example, then it will converge faster than the characteristic time of a single cell. Okay. What will happen to the sum? can we say about the sun? If j is larger than 1, what will happen? Let's start, this is more complicated. Let's, let's start by considering the case of j, which is smaller than 1. Let's talk about positive j. Let's start with j that is smaller than 1. What will happen? It will converge to sigma h. What is the what, but how long will it take it to converge? Tau over 1 minus j. So if j is positive, then tau over 1 minus j is larger than tau which implies that the characteristic time of the dynamics of the sum is in fact longer than the characteristic time of the single neuron. What's the characteristic time of an integrator? How long does an integrator remember the past? How long does an integrator remember the past? So let's let's leave this question aside for a second. So we we are talk we we, we let, let's consider something simpler. So we spoke about this uh, issue of uh, this monkey that has to memorize frequency for seconds. Now we said that it's a problem to do it because the characteristic time of the neuron is much shorter than the, characteristic, than the time that it has to, rem to memorize it. The characteristic time of the neuron is on the order of tens of milliseconds and it has to memorize it for seconds, three orders of magnitude longer. Now, when looking at this equation, you see that there is a potential of enhancing the time scale of the dynamics. If j is the, the closer j is to one, the longer is the dynamics. Longer is the time scale of the dynamics. So, what will happen when j, if j is equal to one? Well, if j is equal to 1, then this is 0, so this will not be tau. This will be tau over 0. Converge. Well, infinite time to converge. Not 0 time to converge, but infinite time, time to converge. So what's the meaning of infinite time to converge? How are we going to solve it for j being equal to 1? 
What's the solution when j is equal to 1? How do you see it? You're right, but how do you see it? Well, the, the trick is not to look at this equation, but to look at this equation. So when j is equal to 1, then the dynamic equation for the sum is just tau a, a sum of r dot is equal to sum of h. Or sum of r dot is equal to an integral over time and I forgot the one over time. So as j approaches 1, the characteristic time of the dynamics of the sum diverges such that when j is equal to 1, the uh, um, dynamics of the sum is that of an integrator. So this is how network interactions can enhance the characteristic time of the dynamics. And for the right value of connections, the dynamics will, uh, uh, in this case, will become that of an integrator. So if j is equal to 1, the network will uh, maintain the, the fine rate of the network, the sum of activity of the two neurons, will be uh, uh, equal to the integral over time of its past inputs. This is thinking about the sum. What will happen to individual neurons? How will individual neurons behave in this, in this example? So the sum, if j is equal to 1, then the sum integrates the input. But what will the individual neurons do? I'm sorry? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear it. This one. This one. This one. This one. Yeah. Yeah, but this is this is the dynamics of the sum. But I'm asking about the individual neurons. We often record individual neurons, not sum of the neurons. So what we will how will the individual neurons behave? So looking at this equation, we know that the difference in the activities of the individual neurons will be small. Oh, at least if there's no input, they, they will it, it, it will fluctuate. If, if, the input, if, the, if the input is constant, then it will converge to delta H. So we know that the sum is an integrator and the difference is a constant. So by looking at each neuron, we will be able to see the integrated input in this case. Questions about this example? It's sigma r. Yeah, sorry, sigma r. Yeah. This is dot. And this is sigma r. Sorry. Thank you for for pointing it out. Questions about this example? Yes. Just one more time how we understand the activity of the single neuron. Okay, let's assume that H1 is equal to H2 for the sake of simplicity. So if H1 is equal to H2, 
then let's look at the difference. So this would be equal to zero, or this will be uh, equal to zero. So the difference between the activities of the neurons will converge to zero, which implies that both neurons fire at exactly the same rate. Now we know that the sum of activities is the integral. So if both of them have the same rate, then each one has half of the integral. They will represent the integral. Now let's say that this is not zero, but a constant. Then one neuron will fire more than the other. There will be a, co a constant difference between the two. But the sum is, again, the integral. So they will both co-vary with, with uh, the integral. So there are several issues that we need to uh, uh, um, to discuss here. Uh, first one is, uh, I think somebody, maybe it was you, or you, you said something about uh, uh, when j is larger than one. So when j is larger than one, then the time scale becomes, well, negative. That means you have a negative time. So let's look at the, uh, so let's look at uh, this equation. So if j is larger than 1, then we have tau, the sum dot is equal to, this is a negative number, so this would be positive. So this would be a positive number times the sum. And the implications are that the dynamics of the sum will diverge. So this value that allows for integration is on the verge of divergence. So if j is slightly larger, if j is, is, if j is uh, equal to 1, then we have an integrator. If j is larger than 1, then the dynamic, dynamics diverge. And if j is slightly smaller than 1, what will happen? So what, what will happen? So if j is equal to 1, we know that we have an integral. If j is larger than 1, the consequences are catastrophic. The dynamics, the network diverges. If j is slightly smaller than 1, what will happen? Let's say that j is equal to 0.9 or 0.99. Long time. How long? Well, depending on the j. So what do we need? So I told you that uh, the characteristic time of neurons is on the order of tens of seconds, tens of milliseconds, and the characteristic time in these monkey experiments, so the monkey memorizes the input for maybe several seconds, so we need to enhance the time scale by a factor, by, by two orders of magnitude, so what should be the value of j? So j should be between 0, 0.99 and 1. If it will be larger than 1, then dynamics will diverge. If it will be smaller than 0.99, then we have a, we have a problem. Then the, the, the characteristic time will be too short. So we have a mechanism for, for enhancing or, or making the time scale longer, but we have to fine-tune the value of j. This is a serious issue. This is a serious issue. It will only work if J is finely tuned. Why is fine tuning an issue? synaptic efficacy. Now, all these processes, all these chemical, all these, uh, what underlies these are chemical processes, which are all temperature dependent. 
So imagine that you are a goldfish. I know it's difficult to imagine, but try to think about it, okay? You're swimming, and then you move to a region where the temperature of the water is a few degrees higher or lower. This would imply that the temperature of your brain will change by a few degrees. You're a fish. You're not a mammal. No offense. So if the temperature of the brain changes, then all kinds of the, 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 the rate of biochemical processes will also the rate of biochemical processes will also change. So we would expect that these J's will change. So this is something that can be done in experiment. You take a fish, you look at the ocular motor integrator that we discussed previously, you change the temperature of the water and see what happens. Now it turns out that when you change the temperature of the water, well, do, do you want to guess? Well, the, the amazing thing is no. Fish are robust. Or the ocular motor integrator is robust to changes in the temperature. This is something you take expect from an evolutionary point of view. I mean, fish, the temperature of the brain of a fish does change in the water. So you need a system that, that will be robust to change in the temperature. How this is done? Not known. But understanding the, the, the requirements for fine tuning we understand that, that in order to integrate you need fine tuning then this brings the next question okay how how do we well how, how did the evolution uh, 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 come up with with ways of fine tuning the, the synaptic efficacies or the parameters such that the integrator is robust to changes in temperature it's an interesting it's an interesting question more questions so what we saw now was an example of a network characterized by two neurons that can integrate. There can be other examples. Can anyone think of another example, an even simpler network? Simple network that integrates. I'm sorry? Otas. Otas. Let's see. So this is the Otaps. What will be the, the equation? So this would be tau r dot is equal to minus r plus JR plus H. So if J is equal to 1, then the OTAPs will integrate. So now we have two examples. We have two neurons that are connected with excitatory neurons and integrate, and we have the OTAPs that integrate. And uh, on Thursday, we will uh, consider the general case. We will generalize these two examples. I'm sorry? Ah, uh, this independence. Okay, if there's no, if the, if, if the uh, British rule is not, uh, uh, if we are not under British occupation by Thursday, then we'll have to do it next week.